Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Let me ask everyone to come on in and take your seats. We're going to get started here. Uh, my name is Kurt Volker. I have the honor of serving as the executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership, which is a part of Arizona State University. And we have a great partnership, both Arizona State University as a whole and the McCain Institute in particular with the New America Foundation. And so we are delighted to be back here again. Uh, we launched together a series of conversations aimed at focusing on core issues of leadership. And we hope that this is an interesting and useful uh, discussion for you. Uh, we are particularly interested at in trying to reach a young audience of professionals in Washington who are thinking about their lives, their work, their role, the balance of these things, and what they can and should accomplish in their lives working in this town. And we've had uh, a great presentation in our first round of this with Anne-Marie Slaughter, who's the, uh, the president of the New America Foundation. And we have a great lineup here tonight, and I'll let Anne-Marie Anne introduce our speakers. Uh, we um, have about one hour of conversation. It'll be uh, moderated here, but we do encourage you to ask questions and take part. And there'll be a reception that follows, and we do ask all of you to stick around a little bit and mingle so we get to know who you are and vice versa. And so with that introduction, let me turn it over to Anne-Marie to uh, welcome all of you to her home here and also to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. So let me uh, begin act by welcoming you to New America, uh, and also just to say how much we value our partnership with ASU. Uh, the president of ASU, Michael Crow, is on our board. ASU is the new American university, and we are new America, so it fits beautifully together. Uh, but also specifically with the McCain Institute, uh, out of admiration for Senator McCain, and also very much uh, supportive of the McCain Institute's mission uh, in across many issues, but cultivating or, or working on uh, leadership and what it takes to be a good leader uh, through your own studies, but also these kinds of events are something we think is needed in Washington, so we're delighted. So I have the pleasant task of introducing uh, our speakers. I'm going to start with our moderator, Rosie Gomez, uh, who is a child welfare program specialist uh, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and she is a 2016, uh, or graduate of the 2016 Next Generation Leader uh, at the McCain Institute. Uh, Rosie Gomez has over 14 years of experience working uh, in the field of child welfare. Uh, and she works now at the federal level uh, and has uh, done many different things at the federal level, including being the senior policy advisor on trafficking prevention uh, at the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families, which is something I know from my time in the State Department, enormous global issue, but also uh, an American uh, issue. But she's had experience not only in the federal government, but also at the city and county level. I emphasize that because it's very important uh, as a public servant uh, to think about not just the federal government, but also increasingly municipal government and state government. And she's had experience in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and again, if we're thinking about public service, that can happen uh, both at multiple levels of government, but also uh, in the nonprofit sector, like New America, uh, and indeed in the private sector, but uh, you have to choose your jobs more carefully there. So we're delighted to have her as moderator, and she will be interviewing uh, David Brooks. Now, the most important thing to know about David Brooks is that he is a member of New America's board. Everything else is quite secondary, but I'll go ahead and tell you. Uh, so he is, as you know, an op-ed uh, columnist uh, for the New York Times and has been since 2003. And I will say that 
Uh, I remember when he became uh, an op-ed columnist, he had written this wonderful book uh, called Bobos in Paradise. He really burst onto the national stage with Bobos in Paradise, the new upper class and how they got there. And you all are too young to remember, but it captured a particular moment of sort of post-Cold War prosperity and double income, no kids, people living a new bourgeois, bourgeoisie life. Uh, and it, uh, it, it set him up as somebody who f follows his own line. And I would say still, um, he is not predictable as a columnist. You not, and that's a great compliment, <laughs> because we all know those columnists where you sort of know what he, he or she is going to say. Uh, with David, it is often a new book he's read. It's always a sort of cut into a subject uh, that is not predictable either politically or I think uh, in other, other ways. He's had two recent books. The Social Animal, I highly recommend. It's my teenage son's top book choice, or so he told his colleges. I don't know what he did. <laughs> Probably better than Marvel, but at any rate. Uh, <laughs> but it's a, it, I, it's a book I relied on when I wrote uh, Unfinished Business talking about care and caring because it really analyzes how we are biologically hardwired to be connected to others and to care for others. And it's just a, it's a wonderful read, but a very important subject. And more recently, and you'll hear more about this, The Road to Character, which was on the, on the bestseller list, actually number one, and has been, is on military reading lists, and I think presaged or, or got ahead of this sense in the country that we have lost a number of old-fashioned virtues that we absolutely need. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to what I know will be a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and I'm honored to be here and delighted to be talking with David Brooks about the topic of leadership. So as mentioned, I was part of the Next Generation Leaders Program, and one of the books that we had to read was The Road to Character. And it actually made me think differently about my leadership journey and the impact that values can have on leadership. So I wanted to start with a couple of questions from that book. Uh, it seems that sometimes, especially in hyper-competitive or hyper, um, in environments like Washington, D.C., where it seems that getting ahead is the most important, how do you keep with upholding values when others around you may not be? I don't really worry about that too much. <laughs> um, no, I, um, well, in writing this book, one of the things I learned that writing a book on character doesn't give you good character, uh, and even reading a book on character doesn't give you good character but buying a book on character does get you good character. So <laughs> I recommend that you do that. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, the basic foundation of the book is that we, um, uh, there are two sets of social virtues, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the things that make you good at your job, and the eulogy virtues are the things they say about you after you're dead, uh, whether you're courageous, honest, capable of great love. And we, most of us have been filtered through an education system that, um, uh, that teaches a lot more about the resume virtues, about the eulogy ones. Uh, and I find in my students that they come here, they go to New York, and they have what I call a telos crisis, mm -hmm. which is to say some bad thing happens in their life, they get fired, or they have a romantic breakup, and they have a very serious emotional collapse. And I've come to expect a call, so I just got one from one of my former students this week. And Nietzsche says, he who has a why to live for can endure anyhow. If you know why you're doing something, you can handle the setbacks. But if you haven't been taught, why am I doing this? What is my purpose in life? What is my calling? Uh, then when the setback comes, you're sort of lost. Uh, and so in this town, I think one of the great challenges is to keep your heart alive. Uh, this is the most emotionally avoidant city on the face of the earth. Uh, we came here because we're awkward talking about emotion. Uh, and I uh, happen to think that's, um, you know, I, I, read a, I read a book where I recently read about a guy who bought a home and had a bamboo plant next to the driveway. And he didn't want bamboo, so he chopped down the plant. He took an ax, chopped up the roots, poured plant food in the plants, in the, where the roots were, plant poison, excuse me, put some uh, gravel over the plant poison, put cement over the gravel, 
two years later, bamboo shoots up through the cement. And I think we all have that in us, which is our heart's yearning. And usually yearning for fusion, usually with another person or with a career. And we want to get lost in that. And if you do not satisfy that yearning, it'll come out in all sorts of bad ways, or else you'll suppress it forever and you'll be a, a soulless automaton walking around Washington. Okay. And so to me, a lot of cities are more emotionally open and available than Washington is, and that's a fundamental challenge of living here. Mm, great. And you speak a lot about different examples of people with character in your book. So can you talk about some examples that you didn't mention or people currently that you believe have character-driven leadership? Yeah. Well, I, I sort of got the book a little wrong. <laughs> so the, the central formula for character building in the book is confrontation with your own sinfulness. And the people in the book had humility, and humility is radical self-awareness from a position of other-centeredness. The ability to step outside yourself and see where you're strong and see where you're weak. And so all the characters in the book were really good at saying, what is my core sin? And so for Dwight Eisenhower, one of the characters in the book, um, it was uh, anger. He had a temper. And so every day of his presidency, we think of him as this garrulous country club kind of guy, but that was fake. He was a guy who was up at night during the war, during his presidency, hating people, uh, filled temper tantrums, smoking, blood pressure spikes, uh, just his stomach boiling. But he developed a series of methods to control his temper and to fake a persona of cheerfulness mm -hmm. because he knew he couldn't lead from a position of anger. And some of the devices were very shallow. He would, all the people he hated, he would write their names out and then he would rip up the paper and throw it in a garbage can just to purge anger. And so he created a better self. And so that was my character version. When I got done with the book, I realized one thing about my characters, almost all of them, that I didn't realize writing the book. They all had amazing moms. Mm. Their dads were eh, but their moms were all amazing. Uh, and then I came across this study, part of the Grant study, a very famous longitudinal study. All these guys were drafted in the World War II into the Army, and some soldiers, um, rose and become colonels, some stay privates. What was the trait that correlated with the promotion of the army in World War II? It wasn't intelligence, it wasn't physical courage, it wasn't socioeconomic status, it was relationship with mother. The guys who received a flood of love and joy from their moms could give it to their men and they were good officers. And so to me, my new theory of how, really how you build character is falling in love with the right things, falling in love with the highest things and making commitments to those things. Uh, and um, so it, my next book is, is about the four big commitments most of us make in life. We, most of us commit to a spouse and family, to a vocation, to a philosophy or faith, and to a community. And after you commit, after you make a promise to something, fulfilling that promise is what raises your character. So for example, when my oldest kid was born uh, 26 years ago in Brussels, um, he had a very low APGAR score, very unhealthy. And so they, um, the doctors whisked him away to intensive care. And so his mom and I were faced with this possibility that he might die. And so we thought, well, suppose he only lives 30 minutes and we have to endure a lifetime full of grief. Will it have been worth it? And the answer was clearly yes. Now, before you have kids, that logic makes no sense. A kid who was not even aware of himself alive for 30 minutes, a lifetime of grief. But once you have kids, you realize, oh, it makes total sense. There's an infinite dignity to your kids' lives. And so once you experience that level of commitment, you want to make promises to the kid. You want to be there for the kid. You want to go out running or go play golf, but you're pushing the kid in the baby stroller. And after a ha those habits of self-sacrifice, that engraves a ha habit of self-sacrifice, and that engraves good character. So to me, it's our commitments to our kids, to our jobs, to our spouses, to our country, and through the process of enacting that, uh, enacting that love, that we develop good character. And I got that wrong in the book, but you should still buy it. <laughs> I really like how you mentioned the support of fathers and mothers and communities, because obviously being in the field of child welfare, I know how important that is. Uh, so your career, you've had a very successful career. You've uh, written for the New York Times, you still do. I'm curious if you can think of a big break. So that time in your life, maybe early in your career, that was really pivotal. Well, I, I had two. One, I discovered early on what I wanted to do in life, 
At age seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear. <laughs> and I said, I want to become a writer. And it was so useful, so lucky to know what I wanted to do at an early age. I remember in high school, I wanted to date this woman named Bernice. And she didn't want to date me. She dated some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> different values. And I, I've come to call this, and I find it in biographies I read, the Annunciation moment. The moment that happens in your life that prefigures a lot of what will come later. And for a lot of people, it's amazingly young. I read this biography of E.O. Wilson, the great scientist. His parents were splitting up when he was seven. He was sent to live with a, home, a family on the northern shore of Florida. Uh, Paradise Beach, I think it was called. And he didn't know the family. So all day, he just wandered the beach. And he was from inland. He'd never seen the ocean. And he saw creatures he'd never seen before. He saw a jellyfish, never imagined that. He was sitting on the dock and with his feet dangling in the water and a stingray went beneath him. And he was captivated by this new world. And he said at that moment of wonder, a naturalist was born. But he had a, a further purifying moment in that, which hopefully won't happen to us, which is um, he was fishing and he hooked a fish, but he was careless in taking it off the hook and it flopped into his face and the tail pin on this fish poked his cornea. And he lost vision in one eye. Uh, he didn't want to go inside because he was having so much fun fishing, so he stayed out. Uh, and so because of that, he was going to be a naturalist, but he couldn't um, study anything that required both eyes, like birds or anything big. He had to study something small he could hold up to one eye. So he studied ants. And for the next 70 years, he studied ants. But so he had that enunciation moment young. And I think the trick of an enunciation moment is not having it, but recognize you've had it. It's going back and saying, yeah, that was the moment. That was a crucial thing where I just developed some intense interest. Nietzsche has a good advice, too, for um, career selection. And it's basically go back over your life, pick the four times you were most entranced by something, write them out on a list, and try to draw a line through the list. Because you're really trying to unearth the, the obsessive interest that's lodged in yourself. Uh, and so I had that lucky break. And then the final lucky break I had, and everybody has some career freakish thing. I was a student at the University of Chicago. William F. Buckley came to campus. And I wrote a parody of him for being a name-dropping blowhard. And it was a mean, a very mean article. You know, I said he wrote the thir first three volumes of, the, of his memoirs on the day of his birth, um, all of human history, then the seeds of utopia about the nine months of his gestation, the glorious dawn about his birth. He formed two magazines, one called the National Buckley and one called the Buckley Review, Review which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. Uh, and so it was all like <laughs> jokes about him. Came to campus. And at the end of his speech, he said, uh, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. Mm. And so I wasn't in the audience, sadly. But three years later, I called him up and said, is the offer still open? And he said, yeah. He flew me to New York. And I was an editorial associate at National Review. Never asked me my politics. It's a job that he had given to a wide range of people. Joan Didion had my job. This guy named John Leonard, Gary Wills, George F. Will. Um, and um, he became a father figure to me for 18 months. And that was just freakishly lucky. And I want to ask a little bit about, you've written many articles for the New York Times, and sometimes people agree with you, sometimes they don't, I'm sure. How do we get back to the civil discourse in our society? Because I'm sure you have to wrestle with that. So after I took this job, I, I, the first six months on this job being a columnist, my joke about being a conservative columnist at the New York Times, it's like being the chief rabbi at Mecca. It's not a lot of company there. Um, and so after the, in the, when I first started, we put the emails on the bottom of the, on the column. It was right there. And so I, um, I had never been hated on a mass scale before. And I would read all the columns, and I would get so depressed. And finally, I just couldn't go on. So I made my assistant read them, a guy, Raihan Salam. And he would get so depressed. And so we just decided we can't read this. And after six months, I deleted all the emails in my folder. And there were 290,000. And the, the core message was, Paul Krugman is great. You suck. <laughs> and what's good about the emailers is not only do they attack you for the things that are not accurate, but they're good at finding the things that you actually feel most badly about in yourself. 
So they're good at it. Uh, and, but basically, I had to learn first to isolate to, to a large degree, but then adopt the attitude, love your enemy. That just treat them as if they're in some demented way they're bringing you a gift. And because if you get caught up in the hatred, and you follow, you see it on Twitter, people are responding, it just consumes you. Uh, and you just have to adopt that posture. Uh, and that's still true. I, I was at a Nats game during um, the playoffs. And in the ninth inning, some guy turns around, I hope we're not live streaming, he turns around and says, are you David Brooks? And I'm ready for, oh, I love your work, something like that. And I said, yeah, I'm David Brooks. He said, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know you're a fucking idiot. I hate you. And then my son, who was over here, he turned to him and said, do you know who that asshole is? And my son that said, that's my dad. And he said, you should be ashamed of your dad. And he goes off, and he's just like vibrating. And he, he said, I'm hands with shaking. I'm in the presence of pure evil. I was like, geez, I'm not that bad. But um, so at that instant, I confess I didn't exercise active love for my enemy. Um, but I still think that's the right attitude. That's the only way to deal with it. Um, or else you just get consumed by what's out there. And Ambassador Volker mentioned that the audience we have is younger. Um, so I'm curious, some, some of us are, right? So what about the millennial generation do you admire? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, I, I, this is an unformed thought. You know, I, you know, I teach my students, and they're millennials, uh, and there are lots of things that I I, I don't blame them, I blame us. That a lot of them have not given thought to really what's the deepest part of their soul and do not have a moral vocabulary. But that's basically not their fault, that's our fault. And so a lot of us have gone to commencement addresses. And if you look at commencement addresses, they generally are filmed with the most useless garbage advice possible. So basically you're getting out of college, you're in the most supervised childhood and human history, and all of life is station to station, next test, next admissions process. Then you get spit out into your 20s, and you're in the least supervised part of life in human history. And so people are looking for a way to plant themselves. And so what do we say? Explore your options. Be free. People are looking for a way to nail themselves down. And we say, oh, be free. Freedom is great. It's like people are drowning in freedom. Then they say, well, uh, what should, you know, how should I use my freedom? The future is limitless. Your potential is human, limitless. Where should I go to find answers? Look inside yourself. You do you. <laughs> it's like, if I knew what you was, I wouldn't have this problem. And so we give these empty boxes of autonomy and freedom, and it's just useless. And, and so no wonder. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's just a challenge. And I find a, being in your 20s now is just phenomenally hard. Uh, and I recommend a book by Meg Jay. If you don't think it's hard enough, this book called The Defining Decade, um, it'll totally make you panic because it says if you haven't figured out everything out by age 30, you're over, your history. Um, but it has some good, some good advice in there. For example, she's the concept identity, con identity capital. Do the thing that's gonna make you most interesting. And so for example, one of her patients, she's a psychologist, wanted to work at Starbucks, but she got offered a job teaching at, um, uh, at Outward Bound. She didn't want to do it. She said, if you take the job at Outward Bound, every interview and every dinner conversation for the rest of your life will be, what was it like to teach at Outward Bound? That separates you from everybody else. My second bit of advice, and a lot of you are too old for it, is um, your first jobs out of college are probably gonna suck. So your only job is to widen your horizon of risk. And so I had a friend, she graduated from UVA, she tried to get in Teach for America, she didn't get in. So she Googled teach abroad. And some guy in Korea wrote to her and said, we need an English teacher in our little Korean village. She told her parents there was a big organized program. <laughs> the guy sent her a plane ticket, she arrived in Seoul, took another flight to this fishing village, and she gets there at like 11 at night, there's nobody there to greet her. She doesn't teach, she doesn't speak any Korean or know anything. So she's sitting there at the airport, sits there for a few hours writing in her journal in a growing panic. There's finally, there's only one other guy with her, a monk on the bench outside. He leaves, they turn out all the lights. She's sitting there in the dark in the middle of Korea. 
And at 3 in the morning, a van with five Korean guys pulls up and say, are you our teacher? And my, I would have killed my daughter if she did this. But she said, yeah. And they said, get in the van. <laughs> <laughs> so she spent the next 19 months teaching English in Korea and having a great time. But having conquered that, she had widened her horizon of risks. She then became an impact investor for a place called Acumen, working in Nigeria, Pakistan, and she could do anything because she, yeah, I got this. And so if you, if you widen your horizon of risk, forever after you have this horizon. If you narrow it, forever after you have this horizon. Uh, and I, I uh, had an, another friend who, he was in the job interview. He was being interviewed for a job. And he, at the end, he turned it around and asked the interviewer, this question, which is a good question. What would you do if you weren't afraid? And she started crying, because she wouldn't be doing HR for this corporation if she wasn't afraid. And I now ask my students at Yale, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And every class, two or three say, I wouldn't be at Yale. They're af too afraid to give up the brand. But, and, but that's a good question to ask. I've totally forgotten what the original question was, but that's my long, <laughs> that's my long answer. Well, and adding on to that, uh, you know, the world changes with each generation, and now we live in this digitized world where we communicate differently, we receive and send information different. So how does that impact leadership? Yeah. I now remember the question, which I never actually got around to answering about millennials. But I do want to answer that, and then I'll weave in. So to me, the, the hard part about being a millennial is the lived experience. I don't believe in generations that are that much different from each other but generational stages, a life stage is different. And when I, I grew up, I was born in 1961. I had sort of a, not too long ago, the World War II was won. I had a vestigial memory of the Civil Rights Movement. We won the Cold War. I basically, a lot of my early formation is pretty successful American involvements. Someone born in 1984, 1980, um, well, Iraq, financial crisis, Trump, uh, it's not like a great story. And so I understand the, um, the loss of faith in institutions. And, and, but to me, there, it, to be the great blessing of the millennial generation, and I have not, I'm, this is gonna be a column I'm gonna write next week so I haven't thought it through, is the great number of people who are hyphenated. <coughs> they used to have a phrase in the 19th century, amphibians people who are good at walking on land and water and swimming in water. And whether it's different ethnic backgrounds, different political backgrounds, there are a lot of people you notice who are, are third culture kids or they just have, they inhabit contradictions. My current research assistant is a very traditionalist feminist. And these two things sometimes push against each other, but that's creative for her. And so there's, uh, to me there's great strength in that hyphenation especially in a culture that is desperately lacking for bridging capital, for people who are in one community but can bridge it to another community. To me, that's just a tremendous source of strength. Um, now, as for the technology, I, I've come to, like everyone else, I, I was excited at first, and now I'm deeply alarmed mm -hmm. uh, that it is rewiring our brain patterns in all sorts of ways. That the, one of the astounding facts of our age is that we've learned so much about the human mind We've learned so much about even pharma, uh, drugs, the, the mental health drugs, and yet depression rates are going up, mental health rates are going up, suicide rates are going up. That's just weird. And I, have, I happen to think that um, social media is the number one cause. It, it just correlates too well with social media. And the, the, the saying is that we're connected more but relating less. And I, I think that's somewhat true. And it's a, it's a challenge. I noticed some of the early Google and Facebook employees have just created an organization to try to rein in what they unleashed. Uh, and I think that's the wave, uh, the future. Just, it's a tool, obviously we're gonna live in it, mm -hmm. but how do we control it? Um, and you know, I have a friend, who, a guy named Andy Crouch, who wrote a book called The Tech Wise Family. He basically, there are certain rooms in the house, the phones are not allowed, certain times a day. It's just mm -hmm. getting control of this thing. Very interesting. And I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. So be thinking. This idea of mentorship. So who are your mentors? How do people in the audience that are seeking new mentors do that and foster those relationships? Yeah. 
Let me go back to E.O. Wilson because he had a great mentor. Uh, and so Wilson had a mentor who was a professional mentor, which was at the University of Alabama where he did his undergrad. Um, and that was just teaching tacit skills. There's all the skills you can get out of a book. But in any profession, there are skills you can't get out of a book. And the story, there's a philosopher named Michael Oakeshott who illustrated that by having a wheelwright, a guy who carves wheels, in China. And he's carving a wheel in front of the emperor. And the emperor's reading a book. And the, the wheelwright says, what, what are you reading? He says, a book of the sayings of the great men. And the wheelwright says, well, if you're reading the, the sayings of dead men, you're reading the, the, the scum of bygone men. And the emperor is furious. He said, how could you, a wheelwright, tell me what to read? And the wheelwright says, let me tell you what, how it is with me. I'm pushing this tool into the wheel. If I push too hard, I break it. If I don't push hard enough, I don't make any impact. I only know how hard enough to push. It comes from the heart, but it was something that was imparted to me. It can't, you can't get it out of a book. And in any profession, there's that kind of tacit knowledge you can't get out of a book. And mentors give that first thing. So that was a normal mentor, just walking alongside somebody as they do their job. And that was Buckley for me. But then he had another mentor, a guy named Darlington. And Darlington was a, a he collected bugs like, um, like Wilson, and he was famous for his strenuousness. He would climb up 10,000 feet uh, to collect bugs at different altitudes. And one of the things he did, he was in Latin America, South America, and he was collecting beetles, and he went out into a pond, and a crocodile came up and grabbed him and dragged him down. And he fought it off, his whole right side chewed up, he gets to the water, surface of the water again, the crocodile grabs him again and pulls him down again. He fights it off, and then he drags himself through the jungle back to the station to get bandied, bandaged up, and he's nearly dead, loss of blood. And as Wilson writes, that wasn't really the impressive part. <laughs> the impressive part was the guy in a full body cast spent the next six months alone out in the jungle collecting more samples using only his left hand. He devised a way to collect samples one-handed. And I think we want that from our mentors. We want to be shown that what we're doing is hard and worthy of the hardness. Mm -hmm. And so th there's, you know, there's this guy, Jordan Peterson, who's out there. He says, life is hard. Don't whine about it. Just do it. And we want to, I think we want to be told that you know, what we're going to do is going to be really hard. It's going to expand us to get it done. It's not going to come easily or fast, but it's serious. We want it to be serious. And I, I think mentors set that sort of example. We take this seriously. Great. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to open up to the audience. And I think there's microphones. All right, right here in the front. Good evening. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Dan Salado, United States Marine Corps. And I just want to ask you about writing styles. You teach millennials. Uh, you see what they write, and in this generation of texts and tweets, do you see the quality of writing maybe not what you had expected as a younger person? Yeah. Uh, well, I would say I, um, I teach at Yale, uh, so that's like representative of nothing. And um, every class, I've got three or four Marines in my class, so that really brings it down. <laughs> uh, but my students are good writers. It surprised me. Uh, my students are good writers. And maybe I've got the creme de la creme, but I will say um, that I'm, I'm impressed by them. And now every time you go to an employer, they say, I can't find people who can write. And one of the good pieces of advice is if they're, the people who write in any office have great power. Mm -hmm. Because people can't do it, the, the ideas don't get said. Most White Houses, the speechwriters are actually shaping policy because they are actually doing the writing. And while I'm at it, let me give two pieces of writing advice because this is what I do for a living. One is um, follow the masters. So I read two people, George Orwell, essays, not novels, and C.S. Lewis. Mm. Both of them wrote for radio. And so they would never use a big word when a little word would do, and they used clarity. And Orwell was a master of the f first sentence. When you're in college, highly educated people are paid to read your writing. Once you get out, that never happens again. You have to earn it. And so a good first sentence, he has a sentence he's writing about, the, he's in the Blitz in World War II, he's writing an essay about being English. And the Germans were bombing him. And the first sentence of an essay was, 
high over my head, highly civilized human beings are trying to kill me. It's a good sentence, you wanna know. He, he wrote about being in public school, or well, what they call public school, we call it prep school, and he said, six months after going to Crosswell's, not long, but long enough so it should have not happened, I started wetting the bed. It's a sentence you wanna know, well, why is he wetting the bed? It's a good first sentence. The second thing I say is that, um, to me, writing is not typing into a keyboard. Writing is about traffic management. So I have a very bad memory. So every thought I have, I write down immediately. And when I collect for my columns, I usually have two or 300 pages of notes. And for me, what I do is I take all this paper and I lay it out in piles on the floor of my living room. And each pile is a paragraph of my column. It's only 850 words, but I might have 14 piles laid out there. And so the writing process is not typing into the keyboard. It's crawling around in my living room, arranging my piles. And if you don't get the structure right, nothing else will flow. And so it's, it's by the I tell my students, by the time you sit at the keyboard, your paper should be 80 or 90% done, because, because it's all structure. Uh, and judges have an, a, a saying, that opinion won't write. They thought they understood it, but once they actually sat down, they realized, no, it's not working. Don't try to save it, totally restructure. Don't try to salvage something that's not working. And so that's random writing advice. Good question. In the back. Or. I'm George Bogdan. I work at the office of Walter Russell Mead. Um, I had a question about a column you wrote a while back on gracious leadership. And as I recall, you quoted um, John Keats that nothing is real till it's experienced. And so I really enjoyed your talk full of uh, cases of really successful uh, examples, but I was wondering if you could give us an example of an epic failure that ended up for the best and produced a gracious leader. The, an epic failure that produced a gracious leader? Yes. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, there was a guy named, I don't know why this story left into my mind, there was a guy named John Callender, and Callender was a lawyer in Boston in 1776, and he was the, the chief artillery officer at, in the American Army, in Battle of Bunker Hill. And the shells started flying, and he abandoned his post. And when George, Marsh, George Washington came to um, uh, take over command of the Army, his first act as commander was to court-martial John Callender and kick him out, cashier him, kick him out. But there was a loophole in the um, uh, in the court-martial, it said he could not come back as an officer. It did not say he could not enlist as a private, as an enlisted man. So he went to Rhode Island, he enlisted again, and then in the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, he went, he was a, just a lowly private. Everyone held him in contempt because he was a notorious coward. And all the officers in his unit were killed. All the, a lot of the men ran away, and he stood alone with his cannon and fixed the wrong. And I do think it is that um, moment of failure is, um, is a valley of vision. I, I'm sort of against a lot of the commencement addresses that say failure's great, learn from failure. From this you learn that for J.K. Rowling or Steve Jobs or Denzel Washington, failure is really awesome. For the rest of us, it just sucks. It's just failure. <laughs> so like, I'm not in favor of like, oh, failure's so great, you all gotta fail. But, um, but there are moments um, uh, and you know, humility is radical self-awareness, as I said, and it doesn't come unless it's forced upon you. And so it's those moments of failure where you discover um, who you really are. There's a Paul Tillich, a 1950s theologian, said moments of suffering uh, remind you you're not the person you thought you were. They carve ben beneath what you thought was the floor of your soul and reveal a cavity below, and carve beneath that and reveal a cavity below. And it's at those moments of failure you realize who you are and really what you really need to fill those deep cavities. And the people who shrink from moments of failure and suffering are those who dwell on them and ruminate. My rule for introspection is get in, get out. <laughs> <laughs> but those who can take their moments of failure and turn into a, 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 a narrative of redemption, then they grow from it. And so the, the, the story is, can you turn it into a chapter in my longer narrative for redemption? And again and again, you find that pattern. Um, 
my other bit of advice is, and this is a lot of people have mid-career anxiety, like what am I doing here? Um, it's that my, when I'm, people have that, I say go to the desert. Go to the desert and hang around in the desert for a, a month or two. Because the desert is a spare environment in which you, where, where you have to confront yourself. And usually when you're doing a life um, that doesn't satisfy you, suffering from acedia, which is a disease of lack of desire. Um, when you're suffering from that, usually it's because you've lived the life that others want for you, but not the life you want for yourself. And you've got to get their voices out of your head. And suffering helps do that, but so does this stay in the desert. Hi, my name is Isabel, um, and I work at New America. My question is just that you mentioned Meg Jay's Defining Decade. I've read the book obsessively multiple <laughs> times. Uh, most people would say too many times, too closely. It really does inspire panic. Um, but, but one thing that Meg Jay talks about and that you mentioned is the idea of identity capital. Um, and, and for instance, you spoke about the acquaintance that you have that, um, that ended up working teaching English in um, in South Korea and then ended up working in Acumen. But, but my question and, and something that I wonder is that whether or not that advice that's being given to millennials, whether or not that's based upon the experience of the, the sliver of, of an almost generation that came before us, like the zennials, so to speak. Because now there's, there's so many, I mean, there's more college graduates than ever among the millennials. There's more um, there's more people who are impact driven, who are college educated, et cetera, that, that while doing something like Outward Bound or, or speaking in South Korea makes you memorable in an interview, it doesn't help you get the interview. So what do you, does identity capital only matter in, in face to face interactions? What is that step, like I'm sure that there's a step between teaching English in South Korea and working at Acumen. Um, and, and what do you think about that? Do you think that it's, that it's a bit too late now? That, that that's advice for, for people that were born about seven years shy of the millennials? Or, or what do you think of that? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just give personal experience as someone who occasionally hires people and hires millennials. Um, is that I, I got a resume a year or so ago and the woman had gone to Harvard and she had a 3.9 and she'd done the perfect inter, uh, internship track. You know, BlackRock, Goldman, she, it, she managed it perfectly. She was president of this, she was head of that, uh, and it was just like a perfect resume. And I remember thinking, who is this human being? Uh, and then I thought, wait a second, there are a million of these people. And, th and then that is true, there are a million perfect resumes out there. And so when I'm looking around, and I think this is true, I've talked to other people who hire, um, I look for someone who did something that makes no sense by the standards of normal career advancement. Who did something completely idiosyncratic. And so I had um, hired someone, she had gone to Andover uh, and gotten very good grades and then had gotten to a, gone to a small Christian college called Wheaton in Illinois. I thought going to Wheaton probably wasn't very popular at Andover. And that suggests some, some, some depth there, some strength of character. And so I still think the perfect resume is, uh, is unattractive because there are just too many of them. And the idiosyncratic um, is still the, what people are looking for. Um, I have a friend who hires a lot of people and I say, well, what do you, what do you ask in the interview? And he says, um, I always, in every interview I ask this question, uh, Name a time you told the truth and it hurt you. Uh, so I tell my students to fake that one. <laughs> but I, I do think it's, it's uh, the thing that gets you to stand out, not the, not the perfect resume. And in, in school, the, the damaging thing about school is it really pays to be good across all subjects. But in life, you only have to be good at one thing. Uh, and so someone who's obsessively interested in is going to live, breathe, or die on that one thing. And I happen to need that thing. I'm now in the process of hiring, by the way, and I've had a lot of coffee with a lot of students, if you, a lot of 25-year-olds, 
If you ever go to um, Firehook in Farragut Square, you'll see me there with the 25-year-old. <laughs> Most of them, the subject of the interview turns into, what can I do for them? Like, why do they want this job? How would it help them? And no one ever thought to tell them, no, the subject is, how can they help me? Because I'm doing the hiring. And they, somehow it never occurs to them to think, here's what you need, and here's what I can do for you. One of my fellow board members of New America is a guy named David Bradley, who started the advisory board and a lot of other companies. Got out of school, wanted to start a consulting firm. And he said, I've got, he went around to CEOs and said, I've got 15 subjects of expertise. Here's what I can do for you. Here's what I can do for you. And finally, a guy said to him, and he got no clients. And the guy said, you're boring me. Just ask me one question. What keeps you up at night? And then do it. And so paying attention to the other person's need is the key to a good interview. It's interesting. I, um, my husband used to say that when he interviewed people, he really liked athletes. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, because they can be coached. Yeah. I know if they've done really well in athletics, they can be yeah. coached. Yeah. Interesting. In the back? I would have been screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hello, this is a great honor. Um, my name is Marty and I'm on the board of the directors of the Arizona State University Alumni Association here. And so I'm really very proud and very appreciative of our relationship with the New America Foundation and with the McCain Institute, so this is great. Um, pardon me if I ask a, uh, a current events and a partisan question, but when you were talking about your halcyon days with the National Review, it made me think of, you know, when during the days of the, the lost in the wilderness after the, the thrashing in 1964, they sort of really focused on be becoming the conservative movement was built around ideas and, and thinkers. And um, I'm just wondering if I were to think about that today, only like one guy comes to mind, maybe a, a person like Ben Sass, and I wonder if you've met him. And are there any thinkers left in the conservative movement? And if so, who are they? Um, <laughs> no, it was funny. When I came out, like there was Buckley, there was Irving Crystal. I, I had real heroes, Gene Kirkpatrick. I had, they were my heroes, James Q. Wilson. Um, now we've got Ann Coulter, Dinesh D'Souza. Uh, no, there, there are thinkers. The problem is the party has moved away from its, from its thinkers. I, I've gotten to spend time, I live not near him on Capitol Hill with Steve Bannon. And he's a thinker. It, being with him is like being with Trotsky in 1905. It's like he has a plan, he knows who his intellectual roots are. He's a theory of history, theories of change. He's got a 50 year plan, Donald Trump is a phase taking over the Heritage Foundation as a phase, taking over this Republican Center as a phase. He's got his international alliances with Victor Orban and Nigel Farage. It's a very coherent package. Uh, and he understood, stands what year it is and what the problems are. And frankly, a lot of us on the right and left, um, we didn't know what the debate was about. And we've spent the last year um, sort of being appalled knowing what we're against and not knowing what we're for, and a little dispersed. And I think now we're beginning to mobilize, but um, I just think it, the history ch turned. And a lot of the Republicans were stuck either in the era of Ronald Reagan, which frankly is where I think Paul Bryan is, uh, in a paradigm that was no longer appropriate for the moment. And Trump, to his credit, understood the paradigm was outdated, and he smashed it. And now we're going to have a period of paradigm competition. Um, and I think, I do think thinkers will emerge. I think it, we're beginning to see there are a bunch of books, even this year, that I think are very creative on the right. There's, Jonah Goldberg has a book coming out on, on tribalism. This guy, Patrick Deneen, on the failure of liberalism. Uh, I think the smartest thinker on the right is a guy named Yuval Levin, who run, edits uh, National Affairs. I, I think we're actually due for another period of creativity, just because everything has been smashed. Um, and Ben Sass um, is one of them. I think he's a, a truly impressive leader. A lot of people say, well, he, he's only anti-Trump in tweet and not in action. But frankly, I would, I would wish he would be a little more aggressive sometimes. But I, you can't ask a politician to leap out where there's not a community of thinkers and activists and donors ready to catch them. And right now, the anti-Trump community does not have the cohesion enough to leap out and be there for a Ben Sass. That may develop, but it's not there yet, so I don't totally blame him for being a little cautious at this moment. McCain would do it if he were younger and healthier. He would, he, he never, he, like, he never found a firefight he didn't want to fly into, so. All right, 
Yeah, I was uh, going to ask you a question about Jordan Peterson, but you just started talking about the anti-Trump movement, so I think I'm going to segue into that. Um, I just moved up here. I graduated from a small private liberal arts school in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, my family has roots up here. My father grew up in McLean. He uh, taught at Langley High School. Uh, and we relocated to Lynchburg about eight or nine years ago. So I had the experience of living up here um, for about 13 years of my life and being inside the Beltway and then moving down south to Lynchburg, which is way more blue collar, and having that experience and kind of that shaped my, shaping my adolescence. And so you're talking about the anti-Trump movement is what I can interpret from a conservative standpoint that doesn't really see eye to eye with, with who Trump is and who his character is. How do you connect the inside the beltway mentality with the blue collar people who voted for him in, in areas like Lynchburg or, or Bedford yeah. County where you know, these are people where a lot of, a lot of minds up here write them off as, as racists or bigots and people who are out of touch with the 21st century, but having both experiences these are great people, you know. They're they're, they're family value oriented, but, but but they're not bigots. You know, they're not, they're not racist. Like, how do you bridge that gap into an electoral base for the Republican Party or for the Democratic Party to where, you know, the the, the elitist mentality is linking up with the more down to earth person who's living three and a half hours south or even more southern than that. Yeah, and that's a good question. I'm sometimes guilty of not honoring that just because you get hyped up in the, you know, I get appalled by Trump and I get hyped up. My one line answer, my one liner about that is that Donald Trump is the wrong answer to the right question. That the, the people in, you know, in Lynchburg or, I, you know, I wrote 16 or 20 columns in 2015 saying, don't worry, Donald Trump will not get the Republican nomination. And so I got that so wrong, I spent the next year and a half really driving around and just reintroducing myself to a country I should have been more in touch with. I, mean, I, I live here, I spend a lot of time in New York, I teach at Yale. How could I be out of touch with America, you know? <laughs> I mean, they sell a quiet car, you know. How much more in touch can you be? So, so I spent um, that time just trying to learn. And so the sense of being a forgotten, of nobody listening to you, of people looking down on you, the sense of insult. My basic diagnosis after that trip was that we have a crisis of social solidarity. That there's a lot of loneliness, there's a lot of loss of connection. A lot of people have seen the communities they love shredded by loss of jobs, loss of family, uh, isolation, et cetera. And so the question is, how can we fix that? Well, the short answer is that we have to, the parts of the country that are healthy are often at the local level. Sometimes we were talking about Jim Fallow, some cities are healthy. Some churches are healthy, some community organizations are healthy, the military is healthy. And so how can we take all these local bits of health and put them in the leadership and ask, how can you solve our national, how can we address this on a national level? And it starts by learning from what's local and then trying to bring it up to the national level. Uh, and you know, people like 56-year-old white guys are not going to be leading this, uh, this renewal. And it has to, uh, has to be people at the local level who then say, it's not enough to be healthy locally, we need a healthy nation. Uh, and I think one of the, by the way, one of the challenges that um, we have in front of us is to have a national narrative. I was raised with a certain narrative, an immigrant narrative. It was, this is the Exodus story. Our people left oppression, crossed the ocean, came to the promised land. I find more and more Americans don't believe this is the promised land anymore. It's not the land of milk and honey. It's been betrayed too much. The institutions are too sick. There's too much oppression and racism and snobbery and uh, elitism. And so you can't tell that narrative. So we have to come up with another narrative. And to me, the a possible narrative is, a, a, is the word that America's an experiment. In many ways, the experiment's been betrayed. But we're only at the beginning of the experiment. We're not at the end of the experiment. So we have to go on a journey of of forgiveness and reconciliation. And the model for that is Lincoln's second inaugural. If you go to the mall and read that thing, he, he could have been like beating his chest, we beat you guys, you guys had slavery, we didn't, we won. But instead, he, the key words in that speech are all, everybody, all of us. Slavery is not a Southern problem, it's an American problem. The scourge of sin had to be paid by all of us. We all deserve this. And so it's an act of great communion 
Uh, and so honoring all the different populations and taking those local successes and trying to build them into something national is a way to show respect uh, to the people who are living good lives on local levels. I'm kind of curious about his question about Jordan Peterson, but to be <laughs> fair, I'll go to, I think, right next to it. Yes. Um, I'm Gabriel uh, Greshler. I work at the Student Press Law Center. Um, I'm, you were talking about kind of overcoming hardship and, and your students that call you and they're devastated. Um, I'm wondering a time in your life when you faced um, travesty or something difficult and what you did in response to that. Yeah, well, um, how personal we get. Um, well, I mean, doing, I mean, the, the first bit of the job I described, that was a hard period. Um, but I won't go into great detail, but five or six years ago, I got divorced. That sucks. And uh, when you get divorced, you, um, you lose all bearing. Uh, and somebody told me, gave me good advice, which is don't try to swim anywhere. Just wait and let the water harden around you. Uh, and the way you take advantage of that when you go through a period like that um, you have like desperate loneliness. I like it never, like I used to, I'm okay with being alone usually, but it, I hated being alone. I had to be with people all the time because it was just like having a, a weekend with nothing was just like death. Uh, and, but you sort of took advantage of that moment. I, I sort of, I'm not nostalgic for that period, but everything was raw. And so I was reading like really deep stuff uh, and you know, all these, um, uh, there were all these depressing songs I listened to over and over again. <laughs> but in a period of rawness, you take advantage of it to like, your, your first instinct is to get out of the pain. But the hard lesson is, you know, you gotta stay in the pain long enough to learn what it has to teach you. And so I, I was, I was complete, I completely changed. Um, and you know, I used to be a person who uh, nobody would tell secrets to, because I was always in a hurry. I wasn't broadcasting any vulnerability or anything. And that personality type is sort of rewarded in Washington. And now I'm not like that, I don't know what to say, but hopefully I broadcast a little more vulnerability and people do confide in me a little more. And I think that's partly because of the change I went through in that two or three year period of deep unhappiness. Interesting. Yeah, we appreciate you opening up a bit. Yeah. So I will <laughs> say for anybody who's single, um, I tell this to college presidents, the most important decision any of your students are gonna make is who to marry. And therefore, every course in this college should be about the marriage decision. The psychology of marriage, the literature of marriage, the neuroscience of marriage. And they never listen to me. And then I teach them my course. We have two weeks on the, how to make a marriage decision. And my students are not interested. They're like, one of them said to me, she said, marriage is a box that'll come in the mail when I'm 35. I'm not thinking about it now. I'm like, begin thinking about it. Like, Read George Eliot, read Jane Austen, learn from the masters, see how it's done. You don't want to screw that one up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we actually are almost out of time, or we are, we are out of time. So, Ambassador, I'm going to welcome you up, but I just want to thank David for being here and sharing his leadership journey with us. And I definitely wish you all good luck in your journey as well. Well, David, thank you very much. That was really terrific. I really appreciate that. And Rosie, you did such a great job. Thank you very much for narrating. Uh, please thank Rosie as well. Uh, and we have a little reception set up outside, so please uh, uh, mingle, chat, ask any more questions informally, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this, and I hope we see you again soon. We do have our next McCain Institute event that I want to plug for you. All welcome. It is a debate on North Korea policy that we'll be doing at the Navy Memorial Theater on uh, February 28th. I think the doors open at 5 o'clock. And uh, we have uh, four uh, very seasoned experts uh, on the issues who engage in a genuine debate from different perspectives about how we should be dealing with this challenge. So uh, look us up online, McCainInstitute.org, find information. Hope to see you there as well. Thank you.